Hello everyone, let's start this lecture. So in the previous lecture, this is what happened. We had the current of infinitesimal dipole antenna. And I'm gonna remind you that this was a very tiny dipole antenna uh, for which we assumed that the current as a function of Z was uniform. So that was essentially our current. Then from this J, we found A. And then from A, A was in the Cartesian coordinate, then we find A in the spherical coordinate. And from these A, we found E and H. But we found E and H just in the far field using that simplified procedure. And then after finding E and H in the far field, we, we had power density pointing vector, we had radiation intensity, and then finally, we found the directivity of the antenna. So remember that from this point, everything was in the far field zone in the previous lecture. We used the, those simplified uh, equations to get that. So here in this lecture, I wanna show uh, what happens if I calculate things at everywhere. So, uh, so when I'm saying everywhere, I mean near field and far field. It's gonna be valid for both of them. And uh, we see how the calculation goes. It's more complicated than the previous lecture. But then my main purpose here is to give you some insight about what's going on. Uh, what I'm going to expect from you to understand this, but my focus in terms of things that I'm going to see later would be in the far field zone. So this procedure would be the main procedure in, in our course. So let's, let's do that uh, for now using the general equation. So, so let, me, let me remind you about what was A. So our A, if you remember from previous lecture, if I have my dipole antenna along the Z and dipole has a length of L, the current is in phase towards Z. So A was mu naught divided by four pi I naught L e to the power of minus J K R R and it was in the Z direction. That was my A and A was at the observation point R. So that was my A. And uh, to remind you, the current is assumed to be uniform with I naught. So this is my A. Then I, in, then I converted this A to a spherical coordinate. So I have it here. A in a spherical coordinate became this. So AR becomes cos theta mu naught I naught L four pi e to the power of minus JKRR. That's the conversion to a spherical coordinate. If you remember your A theta was minus sine theta, the same thing mu naught I naught L 4 pi e to the power of minus j k r divided by r, and your a phi, if you remember, that was zero. So this is what we did in the previous lecture, that we essentially found the three components in the spherical coordinate. In the Cartesian coordinate, it only had one component. You convert it to a spherical coordinate, and you get uh, this expression with a phi zero. Remember, in a spherical coordinate, we have another angle, which is phi, but in this case, phi does not appear because if you go around the antenna by changing phi, you will still see the same antenna. So we don't have any phi dependency, but in general, you probably should, uh, for other antenna, you will see phi dependency as well. So this was our A. Now, now, if I wanted to be in the far field only, then what you do in the next step is that you would say E theta is minus J omega A theta, E phi is minus J omega A phi, and you would say E R is zero. That's only in the far field zone, and that's the focus of our course. But let's assume I don't want to do it just in the far field. I want to also include uh, near field not because of curiosity in this case, but maybe to understand what's going to happen when, the, when, we, when we look at the power density in the near field and then compare the power density in the near field to the power density that we had in the far field 
in the previous lecture. So we're not going to do that right now. We're going to go to the more general approach. And for the more general approach, what, what should I do? I have two equations. B H is equal 1 divided by mu naught curl of A and E is minus J omega A minus J omega mu naught epsilon naught gradient and divergence of A. So essentially, this equation tells you that if you want to find it in a more general framework, then these are the equation that you need to use. Now you have A. A is a vector, consists of three components, this, this, and this. You take the curl of it, you have your H, and then you can find E by this equation. So maybe our first step should be to find, to find H from this equation. So let's make a note of these A components that we have, A R, A theta, and A phi, because I'm going to remove them and I'm going to calculate this for you. And after that, we have our H. So let's do that. Let's keep in mind that we have three components of A and calculate this. So I'm going to remove this and let's calculate our H. So H becomes 1 divided by mu naught. Now, curl of A. How do you find the curl of a spherical in a spherical coordinate? So this would be the curl in a spherical coordinate. This would be, there would be an R2 sine theta here. And then you're gonna have your R hat, R theta hat, R sine theta phi hat. And then here you're gonna have your di di R, di di theta, di di phi. And then here you're gonna have your A R, A theta, and A phi. So, let me remove this, and I'm just going to keep that on the side here so that you know this is the equation that I'm calculating. Okay, so if you look at this, this is the determinant. This part is the determinant in, uh, in a spherical coordinate, and uh, what I'm missing here is these R sine theta. So this is the stuff that I, I missed here. And if you look at this, this is the determinant of a matrix. So th this is one way that I personally feel more comfortable doing the curl in a spherical coordinate. So you essentially need to find the determinant of this matrix to find the curl. And uh, if you remember from your previous courses, we have, for example, R hat. We don't have anything behind it. It's just one. The reason is R hat is already in terms of uh, it's a distance essentially it's meter but theta hat is essentially angle so this r theta hat convert that to a, a small distance and then the same thing with phi hat phi hat is also an angle so this coefficient here if you remember i have an r it would be multiplied so to have everything in terms of that so these are something that you can find in uh, the books related to foundations of electromagnetics and vector calculus. So this is our curve. Now, if I calculate the determinant of this matrix, it would be 1 divided by mu naught, 1 divided by R2 sine theta. Now, depending on how you calculate the determinant, uh, you can calculate it. This is the way that I'll do it. So I, I first multiply these. So I'm going to have R hat di di theta. Uh, R sine theta A phi would be here, so that would be my that would be my uh, R hat component. Uh, I have probably another R hat component, which is this one, and this is with the negative sign. So I'm gonna have uh, R hat minus di di phi R A theta. So that's uh, my R hat component. Then I go to my next component, which is theta hat component, and that's going to become plus theta hat, then R di di phi A R. And then I, I have another theta hat component, which is this component here, and that's going to give me minus r di di r 
r sine theta a phi. And then I'll go to my phi hat component. And my phi hat component is going to give me r sine theta di di r r a theta and then minus r sine theta di di theta a r so let me double check that if i have this correctly so so this you can find in the notes and that's uh, the complete derivation would be my note and also in the textbook so you can go over that completely uh, if you like. So yeah, this seems to be correct. And uh, now that I wrote that, I wrote it intentionally with the complete package. So I remind you about KL in a spherical coordinate, but you could easily simplify that based on the fact that A phi was zero in this case. So A phi is zero. So essentially the term that has A phi they're gone. So this has a phi. So this is gone. So I don't have that. This one has also a phi. So this is gone. I don't have that either. And the other thing is that you know, all of them now have, they don't have a phi anymore. So this is that. What else I could do? Remember for dipole, if you look at all the a expression that I removed earlier, they didn't have phi dependency because if you go around the dipole, that's changing phi and nothing changes. This dipole is still the same dipole. So they don't have, they, they did not have any phi dependency. Therefore, any derivative with respect to phi is also naturally zero. So this would be zero. This would be also zero. And what else here? It here I don't have anything, so that that won't be zero in fact here. So, so when I when I when I have that, then uh, then I can actually calculate my h by by this equation. And if I do that, let's see what would be my final result. My final result. I'm just gonna write my final result here for you. So. This is completely gone. There is no R hat component. There is no theta hat component, only phi hat component. So my H becomes, after this calculation, and the detail of the calculation is in the, uh, is in the course out, uh, in the course note. Okay, so that's essentially our H. Now, this is the H that we have. Now, I want you to remember the H that we had uh, for far field. So the H that we had for far field was essentially, if you remember the H that we had for the far field, so I'm just going to write far field zone. If you remember, we had e to the power of minus jkr divided by r, and we also had sine of theta, of course. So here, that's the same thing here. You see, the first term, if you look at this term over here, that's the term that's actually relevant to the far field because you have one r here, you have e to the power of minus jkr, r sine theta. So if you ignore this part, you exactly get the same expression that I got in the previous lecture for the far field zone. It might not look exactly the same because back then I had omega mu naught in the numerator, but then here I have k in the numerator. The reason is, if you look at my previous lecture, you see omega mu naught perhaps in the numerator, and then I had eta in the denominator. So now if you want to change that into a structure like this, you need to you need to keep in mind that you could write this as omega. Uh, I think I had uh, omega here. 
and then you're gonna have omega mu naught and then your eta becomes mu naught divided by epsilon naught so that's what you have and uh, so this is going to be omega square root of mu naught epsilon naught and this is going to be omega divided by a square root of mu naught epsilon naught that's omega divided by c which is k so essentially if i'm not mistaken this was the expression that i had in my previous lecture for h in the far field but you, you see that you can replace it by k, which is wave number, which I have here. So if you also take into account, you see that the first term is essentially, is essentially the h component in the far field. So that's, uh, that's a side note here. So that's my h in the far field. So, sorry, that's my h that's valid everywhere. So we're going to discuss that more to see how we can make it to the far field. But I wanted to emphasize that the first term was the term that we saw based on our far field calculation in the previous lecture. Now let's go to E. To calculate E, you should do this, minus J omega A minus J omega mu naught epsilon naught gradient and divergence of A. Personally, I don't like to do that because I need to one time calculate divergence of A and then I need to calculate gradient of divergence. That, that's two operations that I don't want to do. So I'm going to say, look, E and H are always related. What does relate E and H? I have Maxwell's equation for that. So curl of H is J plus di D di T, remember? In phasor domain, you can write that as J plus J omega D. We know that D is related to E in free space by epsilon naught E. Now, if I'm in free space, there is no J. I'm, I'm in air, right? J is right on the antenna. If you are outside the antenna, there is no J. So this J disappears. So I'm going to have curl of H equal J omega epsilon naught E. Therefore, I can find E by performing this operation. So essentially, if you have your H, which I have, I can take the curl of H and I can find E. So in, in the previous approach that we did in the previous video, we didn't do this because in the far field, E and H form a plane wave. Then I can just say, E and H are related by a very simple equation like this. But now the situation is more complicated when you are not assuming the plane wave. So this is going to be the equation that I'm used. You could use this or you could use this. But since I have H, if I take one curl, I get my E. But here I need to do gradient and divergence, which I want to avoid this one. So I'm not going to do this one. And I'm just going to go directly to Maxwell's equation and say, okay, E is equal to 1 divided by J omega epsilon naught curl of H. So that's what I'm going to have. Now I need to, of course, take the curl in the spherical coordinate. So if I, if I write that, that would be J omega epsilon naught that I have then my curl becomes here r2 sine theta here and then i'm gonna have r hat r theta hat r sine theta phi hat determinant die die r die die theta die die phi and then hr but remember h does not have any r component so this is zero H does not have any theta component, so this term is also zero. H does have phi component, so I'm going to have H phi. So this is what I have, and I need to calculate this care to get to my E. And if I do that, and I have the expression here, and I'm just going to use that expression to get to the final equation. So it's going to be r hat eta i naught l 
cos theta 2 pi r2 1 plus 1 divided by jkr e to the power of minus jkr then plus theta hat j eta k i naught l sine theta 4 pi r 1 plus 1 divided by j k r minus 1 k r square e to the power of minus j k r so this becomes my e my electric field and this becomes my h so so that's essentially that's essentially what the e and h that i have now this is the e and h that we have and let's see uh, let's make an observation point about this and i'm going to remove this part so that i just see the what i want to see right now so you see my my h is written there and it has only phi component and my e has two components r hat and theta hat now let's compare this to what happened in the previous lecture my e in the previous lecture only had theta hat component and it didn't have the three factors here it only had one of them actually the one that is e to the power of minus jkr divided by r so only this term was relevant in the far field zone so uh, so we need to discuss that a little bit here and here i have r hat component but when i went to far field i didn't even have far field component now we need to understand this and to understand this it's in my opinion better to go to power density because i think we could better see what's happening with power compared to just looking at the fields here so let's check power density and see what we can understand from power density so before i go to that let's see what would be our power density it would be half e cross h complex conjugate the same thing that i mentioned in the previous lecture it's similar to circuit where in circuit you say v i complex conjugate so similar thing here so essentially i need to cross this by this so if you cross that what you're gonna get so let's let's uh, let's simplify it so that we can understand it better so it's gonna be half instead of e let's write e r r hat e theta theta hat so it's going to be e r r hat plus e theta theta hat cross with instead of h let's say h phi to represent the whole thing here so it's going to be h phi complex conjugate phi hat so let's now let's cross product these so it's going to become half e r h phi complex conjugate r hat cross phi hat what is r hat cross phi hat it's minus theta hat remember this is r hat theta hat phi hat so you go like this so r hat cross phi hat you're going reverse so it's going to be minus theta hat so this is minus theta hat plus half e theta h phi complex conjugate now you get theta hat cross phi hat you get your r hat so as you see here in this case it's actually amazing that the power density has two components one of them is a theta component let's call it w theta the other one is a r component what what happened in the far field though in the far field when i calculated this power density only in the far field zone the w was only r hat so it was going always outward we didn't have theta hat but now if i calculate my w i also get theta hat in addition to r hat now i want to get to the details of this multiplication i want to actually give you the expression for w theta and w r so let's call this let's call this 
equal to W theta theta hat plus W R R hat. So this component and this component, which represent this and this. So I'm going to give you W theta and W R by multiplying these. But I'm not going to multiply these. It's going to be very long. But I'm just going to write the expression. And then we're going to discuss the expression. So let's, let's write down the expression. And I'm going to clean up here so that I can write the expression for W R and W theta. So let's write down the expression. Let me get rid of these. So remember, W was has two components, W R, W in the R hat direction, and W in the theta direction. Okay, so let's see what we have. W R becomes eta divided by eight, I naught L divided by lambda square sine 2 theta r2 1 minus j 1 divided by kr cube and w theta becomes j eta k i naught l to the power of 2 cos theta sine theta 16 pi 2 r cube 1 plus 1 divided by kr square so this is what I have and I think I have all of them here very good. So all of them are here, and let's discuss these uh, power density. Now, if you if let's let's figure out which one is a real power density. Remember, in the previous video, I had this discussion about resistance and inductance and so on. That if your power density becomes imaginary, then you are storing the energy. It's like an inductor. Remember. I think last time I made an example for inductance. So just for variety, let's make an example with capacitance this time. So if this is V, if this is I, then V is 1 divided by J omega C I. So this is the impedance of the uh, capacitor. Then power is half VI complex conjugate. So if you, for example, substitute for V or I, depending on what you prefer, let me substitute for V, for example, in this case. Last time I substituted for I. So then it becomes one half uh, J omega C I, and then I complex conjugate. So this is your V that I substituted. I times its complex conjugate becomes magnitude of I squared. So you see, now this is a purely imaginary number. Remember, 1 divided by j is minus j. So you can bring this up and write it as minus j half omega c i squared. So this is the power. So if you look at this power, this power is purely imaginary. What is the meaning of that? That means this stores the energy. Whereas for resistor, if you look at the power, it's purely real. That means it dissipates the energy. So this is purely imaginary and purely real. And um, for, for inductor, that's the same thing. And it becomes purely imaginary. So that's the storage of the energy. OK, now, if I look at WR, what do I see? If I look at WR, WR consists of two components. The first component is this component right here. One times that. That's purely real. So one of them is purely real. So maybe I write it like that. WR has a purely real plus a purely imaginary power density. So what does that mean? That means 
part of the power is being lost. Now remember, free space is not lossy. So what you are you what you are saying here in terms of loss of power essentially means essentially means the power is escaping. So it's not like resistor, as I mentioned in the previous video. So this part is your radiation. It's just you losing that power, right? So it, it appears as purely real. This part that comes with the J is purely imaginary. That means you're storing the power right there, right? So around the structure, you're storing the power. So that's the storage of the power in WR. Now, now, if you want to somehow think about this, you may, you may think like this, that, for example, you have an antenna like that, and this is, let's say, my coordinates. Okay, so, so in... in uh, some of the textbook, you might find this analogy. I don't exactly remember which textbook is that. Uh, I think that's a textbook by Professor Krauss. So essentially what it, what it says is that when the power goes in this direction, for example, in the direction of R, if the power keeps going, that means radiation. That's the real part of it. But if the power gets a little, gets trapped, so for example, the power wants to go, but it, it doesn't go completely. It also comes back. So you see, I have power that's going and then coming back. So I'm somehow storing the power here. And then some of this power leaks away and it's going to go to infinity. So now look at this structure that I have here. Remember, this is the direction of R. So some of the power is essentially trapped in the R direction. It want to go, but somehow it reflects back, right? So when it reflects back, then essentially you have a, a stored power. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be intuitive here, so I'm, uh, it's not completely precise. What I want to say is that not all the power is going to infinity. Some of it is in the form of a storage energy here. So you can think of it this way. So that's essentially, this plot that I have shows this part, that part of that is the part that's purely real, is gonna make it, is gonna escape, and this part, this is the purely imaginary component that remains. So this is, this is one thing here, and now, if I go to the W theta, in W theta, there is something interesting, that in W theta, everything is purely imaginary. There is no real component. So essentially, you see that the power is, this is the theta component. The power is going around the antenna in the theta component. So it's going around the antenna in the theta component. So it's surrounding the antenna. So you have two types. So this is also purely imaginary. So when you look at your dipole, there are some stored energy in this direction and also in theta direction, if this is your dipole, R hat direction and theta direction. But some of the power are escaping. And this is this part that's escaping from from the structure. These, these are not escaping. And I'm, I'm going to tell you why I'm not saying why they can't go to infinity. Because the other question you might have is that, OK, you have a purely imaginary, but why not? It cannot make it to infinity. What's the reason? Uh, so essentially, these are bound to the structure. Now, uh, let's, uh, so, uh, so these are going to be around the structure. They cannot go to infinity. Now, let's see the reason for that. The, the reason for that is going to be similar to what we discussed in the previous lecture. To understand that, to understand that, let's understand the power. So remember, these are power density. So if I have an antenna like that, and I, I give you an a sphere here, and I say, okay, what's the total power 
total power passing through this. So you would say, okay, I need to integrate power density, the power density that I have over the surface. So this is, this is essentially what you need to do. Now, remember these surfaces, these are spherical surfaces. So the surface of a sphere, so let's call it area of a sphere, is four pi r square, of course, if this is the radius r. 4 pi r squared. So if the power can keep going, if the total power can keep going, then the power density should be, uh, power density should be 1 divided by r2. Power density is 1 divided by 2, and then area is r2. Therefore, when you find the total power, they can cancel the effect of each other, and the, the total power remains the same. So power density 1 divided by R2, the area, remember, it's R2. So uh, so that's why this power can go to infinity. The, to the total power can go to infinity. So if you look at this part, this power density is the only power density that can keep going. Because this is R2, and therefore, when you integrate over the area by R2, the effect of R is canceled, so the total power passing through that sphere remains the same. But now, look at, for example, this one. This one, if you look at that, there is an R2 here, there is an R3 here. So this component is 1 by R5. So this is 1 R5 power density in terms of R dependency, but then your area increases by R2. So if you calculate the power that passing through a sphere of different size, then you see that power drops by one divided by R3. So very quickly, when you go a little bit away from the antenna, it drops by one divided by R3, the power drops. Remember, power density drops by one R5. Let me repeat it again. This is important. For the, for the one that can go to infinity, power density drop by one R square. The area increases by R square. So when you calculate the total power passing, total power stays the same. So the total power is just the same. <coughs> Excuse me. But now if I go to this component, power density drop by one R5, Area increases by R squared, so the total power drops by 1 divided by R cubed. Now, if you go, for example, 10 kilometer away from the antenna, you're not going to have anything because this is gone. And that's why we have simplification for far field. Because if you are in the far field, you can completely ignore this. This is not going to make it to the far field for you. Now, look at here. In the, in the second one, W theta, you have two components. One of the components is R3. So you have R3 times 1. So power density drops by 1 divided by R3. Area increases by R2. So the total power is still decreases by 1R. So still you're going to lose that. If R goes to far field, let's say R is infinity. If R goes to infinity infinity being far field, this is going to be zero. So that's, that's, going to be, that's going to be an issue. So that's not going to make it to the far field. So what about the next one? The next one is also R5, similar to this, R2, R3, R3, R2, R5. And the area increases by R2. So the total power increases by that. So this is going to quickly die when R goes to infinity, very quickly, uh, quicker than this one. So you see, if I go to far field, the only thing that remains with me is this power density. So that's why everything in the far field is simpler. In the, when you are in the near field, things are more complicated. So this equation, you can say it's also valid for the both far field and near field, because if R goes to infinity, you can essentially ignore these terms. So, and then that's essentially the term that remains for you. Uh, whatever R square dependency should remain. So, so in summary, I can, I can look at this 
and I say, okay, if I'm interested in the far field, if I'm interested in the far field, so far field zone, I can say W theta is zero. I'm gonna completely ignore that. And WR becomes just eta by eight, I naught L lambda square sine two theta R square. So this is my WR in the far field. So this is an exactly what we had in the previous lecture. I mean, in terms of coefficient, it might look different, but in fact, if you a little bit do uh, mathematical manipulation, you see that they're the same thing. So that's, uh, that's uh, hopefully now it's uh, clear. I think the main thing about this lecture is for you to see that how we can go from here to the far field. Now, based on that, remember what's important for us in the far field, what remains for us in the far field is a power density that depends on R2. But now remember that power density is the multiplication of E and H. So for W to have R2, then E should be 1R, H should be 1R. So that's the component that's relevant in the far field. 1 divided by R for E, 1 divided by R for H. So based on this, we can also look at E and H that we just showed in the beginning of this lecture and find their far field component. So again, because W in the far field is just R2, E and H should be just 1 divided by R. Now let's look at R, uh, let's look at R, H that we derived in this lecture. So let me find my expression for H that I have. So expression for H was right here. So the H that I had was H equal phi hat J K I naught L sine theta 4 pi r 1 plus 1 jkr e to the power of minus jkr. So this is the h that I had. Now, what did I just say? I mentioned that h that's going to be relevant to far field is the h that has only 1 divided by r. Now, I have if I just consider this one, I have one divided by R. But if I include that, that's going to give me R2. I don't want that. So I can say in the far field zone, the H that's relevant in the far field zone is H equal phi hat J K I naught L sine theta 4 pi. This R with this, I'm just going to write it as e to the power of minus J K R R. So that becomes my H in the far field. This should be exactly the same H that we derived in the previous lecture. But in the previous lecture, because from the very beginning, we assume we are in the far field, we didn't go through so much problems of calculating this equation. So you see that's, that they should be essentially identical. Now, the same thing for E, if I have the equation here, I'm gonna I'm gonna share it with you. So if I look at my equation for E, this is gonna be far fit. So let me remove my H and I write my equation for E. So I had my E that I derived today, R hat component, eta I naught L cos theta two pi R two. 1 plus 1 divided by jkr e to the power of minus jkr plus theta hat j eta k i naught l sine theta 4 pi r 1 plus 1 jkr minus kr square e to the power of minus jkr. So this was the e that we derived from this uh, in this method. So we didn't assume any far fit condition. But now let's assume you have that. You just want to take the far field component of it. So far field 
zone. If I'm in the far field zone, then my E becomes. So I look at this expression. This expression cannot make it to the far field because I don't have one divided by R. If this is either one divided by R2 for this or one divided by R cubed for that. So this is completely non-relevant to the far field. Now, if I go to this expression, I have one divided by R for this but this one becomes one divided by R2, and then R multiplied by that, one divided by R cubed. That's not gonna make it to the far field, so this is the only one that's gonna make it to the far field. So let Okay, so finally we said that we should ignore this, we should ignore this, we should ignore this, because they have R dependencies more than one divided by R, so finally our far field zone E would be uh, theta hat, J eta K I naught L sine theta four pi e to the power of minus J K R R. So that's essentially this is the only component that we have, and that's our far field E. So now we have our far field E. The far field H that we wrote before, let me try to find it. So the far field H that we had was, uh, if I have it here, I can. So the far field H for us was H equal phi hat, then J K I naught L sine theta four pi e to the power of minus J K R R. So this was our uh, this was our uh, H. Now let's let's check A, E, and H. First of all, both of them has this component. So this is this essentially shows that we have this uh, spherical spreading, and then both of them has the angular dependency of sine. So this is if this is essentially the angular dependency of field because power would be multiplication of these two, angular dependency of power is sine squared. Both of them has four pi, of course. Both of them has I naught times L. So both of them has that too, that sine theta. And uh, the other thing is that this one has a J. This one has a J. The existence of J is not that important here, but remember, if this one had J, this one didn't have J, then they wouldn't be in phase. Because then this would be 90 degree uh, phase difference with that. But both of them has J. When both of them has J, then they are in phase. And then this results in real power. If, for example, this J didn't exist here, if you calculate the power, you get purely imaginary. So that's not radiating, and that therefore that does not belong to the far field. So the fact that they are in phase is very important. The other thing, here you recognize K eta, but if you look at H, H is eta times a smaller than E, so you lose your eta and you only have K. And of course, the directions are perpendicular, and it's perpendicular to the uh, R hat component. So that's a... Uh, that's R H. Now, this is should be identical to the previous lecture that I had. Uh, as you remember, you can just do some manipulation and then uh, you should be able to show that they're the same thing. Uh, one thing that uh, I'd like to mention and in the previous lecture I forgot to mention is the radiation resistance. So in the previous lecture, I calculated total power radiated for you. And the way that I did that, I, I calculated radiation intensity from here. I calculated total power radiated. So, so let, me, let me remove that and write down the total power radiated. So the total power radiated is equal to, I have now, an expression which is uh, after a couple of more a step of math compared to my uh, compared to what I wrote in the previous lecture, but they should be identical. So this is the total power 
radiated by the uh, dipole antenna, infinitesimal dipole antenna. That's our total power radiated. So you see, uh, first of all, you have the ratio of L with respect to wavelengths. That somehow confirms our point that the things that's important for us is the lengths with respect to wavelengths. So you have the lengths with respect to wavelengths here. And of course, if you give more current, you have more radiation. And this is our eta, or sometimes I write it as eta naught because we are in free space. Now, if you want to calculate the total, the radiation resistance, so you can simply say P radiated is equal to half radiation resistance and I naught square. Essentially, this is the circuit equation for uh, power. So you remember in circuit, the power in a resistor would be half RR I naught square. So you essentially equate that. And so you would say this is equal to that. And as, as you see, as soon as you equate this I naught square here and I naught square here, they cancel. And then you can find the expression for your RR, which becomes, uh, I can just start with uh, one equation first and then go to the other one that I mean. So L lambda divided by two. So if you do it, you get this equation, but then uh, uh, if you substitute for eta, which is 120 pi, so you go, Eta 377, which is 120 pi, L lambda to the power of 2, you get to the equation that's very famous. And this is going to be 80 pi square L lambda square. So this becomes the radiation resistance of an infinitesimal dipole antenna. So this is, uh, this is our radiation resistance. Common mistake that I've seen sometimes a student do when it comes to this is that they they use this equation for any lengths. But remember the whole derivation here, for example, the total power radiated depends on ENH. And this whole radiation was on, based on the fact that uh, the length of the dipole was very uh, small. In this case, we said this is infinitesimal dipole. So when you are using this equation, remember this is for very uh, small lengths. And you shouldn't really use it for other things. And we're going to discuss that later on. And for this example, for example, assume that L is lambda by 50 and substitute L lambda by 50 here. And of course, lambda cancel. And then you see that how a small this radiation resistance is. So this essentially shows that this antenna is not a good antenna because uh, the radiation resistance is so uh, small. And uh, the, uh, the other thing that uh, you should really uh, uh, step by step learn in this course is that the size of the antenna with respect to wavelengths is important. You, you, you need to be like in the order of, for example, lambda by four, lambda by two, and so on. When you have an antenna which is lambda by 50, you won't expect it to be a good antenna.